Good afternoon. Welcome to the Denver Zochin podcast. I'm Joseph Wagner, and today I'm going to be introducing Damien Abel, interviewing him about his Dharma path, how he got involved in Buddhism, how he got involved in Denver Zochin, and everything in between. Welcome, Damien. Hi, thanks for having me. Yeah, it's fun. We can interview each other. That's sort of exciting. Yeah. Well, it seems like uh, I don't know as much about your Dharma history as I'd like to. Can you tell me how you first met with the Dharma and how you got involved with Buddhism? Yeah. Well, I'll start at the beginning that I had some weird, like, spiritual drive from a really young age. When I was five, I asked my parents to take me to church, and they didn't go to church, and I didn't really know what church was or anything. Um, but so they started going to church, and so I was, you know, really Christian growing up, heavily into a Protestant church and went to youth group and all of that stuff. And then when I got to college, I took a comparative religion course, and the teacher really challenged, like, a scientific interpretation of Christianity to the point that it kind of blew my mind about the reality of what I was believing in. And so I just decided I was hell bent on discovering what was true, um, knew I had to go get a degree. So I decided to get my degree in comparative religion from University of Washington. Um, and I was like, did it more just because I wanted to find what the truth was than anything else. And there I took classes on Christianity and Islam and Buddhism and Pure Land Buddhism and so many different things. And I just really came to the conclusion that the Dharma was the most accurate of all of them. And I also saw that there was truth in all of them, you know, that they all were kind of pointing at the same thing, a mystical truth beyond words, um, but that Buddhism had the most sophisticated and clear and concise and precise um, definition of what that all meant. And so um, I looked into it a little more and there was like this saying like Zen Buddhism takes away all your toys and Tibetan Buddhism gives you a bunch of new ones. So I was like, I'm more a Tibetan Buddhism kind of guy. Um, and I went to Sakya Monastery in Seattle and I took refuge with Dogta Rinpoche there in 2004. Um, and so that started my whole Dharma path right there. Wow, wow, that's exciting. So it sounds like you had a, had an early interest and through almost through logical deduction and study you came to uh, view buddhism as the path most most possible for you am, am i right about that yeah yeah and and the most open minded and flexible and you know and had a deep pragmatic see like part of me still is like really kind of deeply christian in a way like i still have a lot of love and respect and faith for a big part of that tradition but so much of that tradition has lost the how right? Like Buddhism is the, the master of the how. how the, you know, so there's like, you look at the Christian mystics and there, there's realizers and all these different traditions, but the modern day Christianity is mostly like, do you believe in Jesus? Okay, you believe in Jesus, we're good. You know, but there's not much like, okay, how do you become like him? And that was more what I was interested in. Even late as a late Christian, I read the book, The Imitation of Christ. And I was like, this is what it's supposed to be like. Like, you're supposed to try to do it, not just follow him. Um, whereas once I encountered Buddhism, it was like all the how. It was how do you become compassionate? How do you become wise? How do you relax your mind and have insight? Um, the, it was all methods. And so to me, that was really the missing piece in my spiritual path. And it provided all of them. And Tibetan Buddhism provides more than you could ever use. Wow. So what led you to meet Dr. Rinpoche in specific? I, I only met him one time. I know he was a major figure in the Saki sect, but maybe you could tell us a little bit about him. Yeah. So I, I just, back then, in the early days of the internet, I just plugged in Tibetan Buddhism Seattle and Saki Monastery is the first one to come up. Um, Saki Monastery is interesting. It was the first Tibetan Buddhist monastery in the United States, I'm pretty sure. And it was in the movie Little Buddha, if you ever want to go see that, but it's in there. And they filmed in the basement there. And um, Dr. Rinpoche was really amazing. So there's two Sakya treats in the two palaces that alternate who run the Sakya school. This is how it used to be anyway. And it would alternate. And so the current Sakya treats in, and Dr. Rinpoche was the head of the other palace. And so he uh, was married, and, and there was a lot of politics around all of that, but I don't need to get into that. But he was an amazing Mahasiddha. Like, I, I know m m many people have told me stories of miracles of him. Like, one time, one of the guys who was building the monastery was working on his car, and the oil carburetor spilled oil all over his hands. And he, they went to the hospital, and they were like, you're going to have, you know, not likely you're going to even recover your hand. 
And Dejan Rinpoche and Dogs Rinpoche went to the hospital and prayed over his hand, and it has a complete recovery. Um, and he he's still uh, still around today. You can talk to him, and his hand is perfectly functioning and well. And um, yeah, and so he and he also is notorious for being able to bend swords. Uh, that's one of the things that supposedly he could do in Tibet, and I, I'm confident that it's true. Um, and also that you would see sparks come from the, the symbol when he would hit it in rituals. And um, yeah, quite an amazing teacher, really like Dzogchen in his approach. Like he didn't teach, like he didn't sit up and like tell you about the Dharma very much. He would talk a little bit here and there, but mostly he would just like be there running the monastery and just sitting like wherever they put him, he just kind of sit in the chair. And um, he was just completely present and, and wasn't ever... Up, it didn't look like he was doing anything ever but somehow the whole monastery was being run uh, all the monks are being taken care of um everything was functioning smoothly but he just was completely relaxed and so, somewhat ordinary you know it, it seemed like he was ordinary but when you were around him you knew that he wasn't quite ordinary mm. so your initial uh connection with uh, Buddhism, Tibetan Buddhism in specific, was at a Sakya Monastery with Dr. Nurbache. Did you continue to study with him or did you you leave that after a while? What happened? Um, so early on in my path, I encountered a friend of mine who was kind of mentoring me with some early of my practice. And he had a picture of a Lama on his altar. And I said, who's that? And he said, that's Keelan Rinpoche. And he lives on Whidbey Island here in Washington State. And for some reason, I had an immediate interest in him. And so sh this is pretty early on, 2004 as well. Um, I went and did a Dzogchen two-day retreat with him. And he, he was instantly my, my root lama. Um, oh. He just, he was a younger lama. He's about 10 years older than I am. Um, but he, he just, everything in the Dharma is through Dzogchen. So for him, he was very traditional in the sense that he expects his students to go through a Nanyana system and do Nundro and all of that. But he's very much a give people the pointing out instructions early on and make those part of everything you do all through the path. Cool. Um, and so that approach to Dharma really appeals to me. You know, once I encountered that, it made the most sense. Um, I couldn't do, nor did I have much interest in big, complicated Maha Yoga sadhanas and stuff like that. Um, it was just too much for me. Um, but the simple, but I didn't want to throw it out either. I enjoyed some Vajrayana. And so Keelan Rupshi had the perfect balance. You know, he does a really simplified version of everything, but it still included all the essential bits. And so that was really what, and then, you know, he just turned out to be like one of the kindest, most gentle, most careful people I've ever met. And that was the other huge piece for me is I wanted a really ethical llama. And um, I saw that Keelan Rupshi was like careful to a fault. Like if you try to ask him for something or ask him to do something, it'll take years for it to happen. Um, he doesn't do anything quickly. Um, but I really respect that about him. And it's been an admirable quality throughout these last 20 years. Mm. So are you still studying with him now? Or? Yeah. And, and I studied with Dr. Rupshi up till his death. You know, like I said, I only had a couple interviews with him. And, you know, he didn't really teach in the way that you think of somebody teaching. Um, I received many empowerments from him um, before he passed. Um, and then once he passed, then mostly my practice was under Keelung Rinpoche. And yes, I still practice with him. I did the launch in Nintik Nundra with him, um, deity yoga, all, all the nine yanas, studied the way the Bodhisattva, the whole thing. Um, and he carefully guided all his students through all of that, through a lot of um, encouragement of a lot of a retreat and discipline. And he really helped me to transform a lot of my life into retreat. You know, he showed me that it's possible to leave a lay li live, <laughs> lead a lay life, but also practice a lot. Um, and that's with me to today, um, that it's still the primary thing I spend my time doing. Hmm. Yeah, just, just to back up slightly, can you tell us a little bit about Keelung Rinpoche for those people who aren't familiar with him? Sure. So he is a tolku of one of the four Jigmes. So Jigme Lingpa, great Longchen Nintik master who... Um, attained his realization through a direct revelation from Long Chempa, who had lived like 600 years prior to him. But in visions, he transmitted to him this whole lineage of Lan Chin Nintik. Um, and Jigme Lingpa had four heart sons. And you're probably familiar with some of them, like Dodripshin Rinpoche or, um, you know, uh, Jowe Nugu 
or um, I can think of the other one. Maybe you can, Joe. No, <laughs> but anyway, this four, all four of them are quite prominent lamas. Keelan mm. Rupsha is actually one of the less, Jigme Notsar Gyatso was the original one, mm. um, but he's one of the lesser known, but he actually is the holder of Jigme Lingpa's purba. So the one that you see Jigme Lingpa in the pictures with the purba in his belt, that went to Jigme Notsar Gyatso. And so his lineage has a huge emphasis on Vajrakalaya. Does Keelan Rupsha actually own that purba himself? I think it's in the monastery in Tibet. Oh, okay. I was just curious since that kind of thing. They have a, a whole great. set of wooden replicas made from teak that are part of this, that, that I actually got to unravel that were made in replicas of it. And so the original one I think is still there, but I think it's like under careful lock and key, but now there's a whole mandala of replicas that he had made. That is really Wonderful. amazing. Wonderful. So he's a primarily a long genetic lineage holder. Yep. Yep. Yeah. That, and, he also was uh, the same Toku as Jatsun, Rigsen Jatsun Ningpo, who was also a huge oh. Terma revealer not too long ago. So that's the same line of Tolkus. Um, and he's the heart son or one of the heart sons of His Holiness Dudrup Shin Rimshe. And so Gilang Rimshe had many teachers throughout his life, but the most important one to him was His Holiness Dudrup Shin Rimshe. And he brought Dudrup Shin to Seattle and we got to meet him as a Sangha, which was an amazing opportunity. Um, the Drip Shermshe was very old at that point um, and kind of reclusive in his whole life. Um, but he really, Keelan Rimshe like only has like one llama if you talk to him. Like he's all, all very devoted to him. And so pretty amazing. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, that was a, another big loss for the Nyingma school when Do Drip Shermshe passed away a few years ago. That's. Uh... A bummer. Well, tell me, that's excellent. Thank you for that. I wasn't aware of some of that uh, about Keelan Rinpoche. How did you come to connect with Denver Zokchen? So um, I think the first time a friend of mine, uh, well, Keelan Rinpoche had a Jigme Lingpa statue. And it was an old version of Looks Like Me Jigme Lingpa statue. And I was like, this is very cool. I wonder where he got it. And I asked somebody about it and they told me, oh yeah, um, it actually came from this website called Future Alchemy. And so I go to Future Alchemy and they have these statues. And actually at the time I was doing coaching and one of the students I was coaching bought it for me. Mm -hmm. And so I got that statue. And so I started looking at Future Alchemy and reading you know, and ordering different stuff because I was just so into like relics and um, all, all of the blessings of the lineage collection. Like there's this one thing where it says inside the Jigme Lingpa statue, I believe there's the ground up, some of the collection of Dedruption's relic collection. Mm -hmm. And if you just read the list of this thing, it's like mind blowing. <laughs> and so I was like really into this and I was reading the descriptions on the website and I was like, whoever wrote this, I need to meet because the, it was just the interest in the same things I was really interested in. Some of the magic quality of Adriana that you just don't hear much about anymore. Mm. Um, and the special substances and the relationship to those and how they can be objects of devotion and empower your practice and um, this kind of divine placebo effect. And um, so eventually I finally was like, I'm going to figure this out. And I couldn't find anything directly on the website. But when I looked up, I found out that it was owned by you, Joe Wagner, and I did a search, search for you on Facebook and then Denver Zogchen came up and I was like, oh, this guy teaches in a group. And so I emailed Joe and I was like, uh, I hear you have a group. I'd be interested in doing it. And so I connected and, and it was instant tendril, you know, like this, this group was what I've been looking for with kind of a younger mentality, a fresh and, um, western approach to dharma in some ways but totally traditional in others um just these elements that i hadn't been able to find you know because i personally don't love practicing with the tibetan temples online you know when you're like chanting in tibetan and waiting and chanting in english and then small group discussions on there can kind of drive me crazy all of that is not my favorite part of Dharma. And so much of it is online now. But Denver Zogchen, really, I love the online way it's done because it's practice oriented. And all the while, Joe, Joe is also leading and teaching, you know. So that for me is a really enjoyable way to connect with Sangha every week. And that's how I've, you know, joined the group and found you and um, been there ever since then. And 
it's all it's only been about a year but it feels like it's been even longer than that i feel the same way yeah we definitely uh have some sort of karmic link it seems that's very nice wow. yeah wonderful wow what do you uh just a cur- you know curiosity myself what do you see how do you see your path unfolding from here i mean you have these amazing teachers you're close to dr Rinpoche, you're keelan Rinpoche, and then you're also part of this our little experimental group and what what do you how do you see your path moving forward i'm just curious personally yeah well you know for me it was a lot of like i have this habit of being i've made myself a highly disciplined person i wasn't a highly disciplined person as a kid or a teenager or even a young adult um but slowly slowly i trained myself into being this very disciplined person who large emphasis on practicing very hard quote unquote but that has also gotten me into some trouble because as you, you know, you need a large amount of relaxation in the path. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what I'm learning to do is relax. And also what's an ongoing Cohen for me is like how to be, how to make the absolute most of this precious human birth, but also be a teacher, a father, a husband, um, and do these things like you know, in some ways, a lot of lamas say, if you really want to progress to the ultimate level on the path, you need to just like, get out of here and go sit in a room in the silence till you get there. But I'm really stubborn. And I'm hell bent and determined that there's a way using all of the resources, and everything in my life as the path to make the absolute most out of my life. And so that's like my that's my kind of ongoing drive and and question is like, how do I get the very most out of this and put the most into it while not abandoning my responsibilities and connections in this life? And, and I'm just determined, you know, that there's a way to do it, you know, maybe not the rainbow body, but at least so good body, right? <laughs> That's how I feel. Yeah, I really appreciate you. Uh your views there, because I, I think that that's part of what Denver Zocchin is really attempting to do is offer a way of participating in, you know, more or less traditional Tibetan version of Buddhism, but for people who are not ready to live in a cave or give up everything in their lives. I mean, that's, that's, that sort of extreme view these days is, uh, although I respect it personally and, and, feel that would be wonderful to do it's very difficult and if that's the only option for people then it's not you know it doesn't leave a lot of doors open so i appreciate your willingness and to try to integrate this very esoteric and ancient path with our modern lives with all of its uh, parent teacher conferences which i think you're going to be doing just in a little while yeah that's right and you know it's like a a bit of a wrestling match. Yeah, I think of like the word Israel, you know, means one who wrestles with God, right? That's sort of what I feel like it is. It's like, how do you get the most out of the spiritual path while also being in the world? And yeah, I feel like this group in particular has given me the tools because the, the practices that we do are extremely potent, but extremely simple. And that, that I think is the real key, you know, and there's been many teachers like Namkai Norbu and um, other Dzogchen teachers who have said really like that's the most important thing is like the most get the most essential qualities of the path and then integrate that into everything else. And then you can get the most out of it. So you can do some of the energy practices, you can do the mantra practice. Um, but if you keep the kind of higher Dzogchen view um, while doing those things, then then it's even more powerful. And I feel like that's really what this group does really well. And, and it and it's also, in, I really appreciate that it encourages diligence because I've, there's it kind of can flop either way. I've been in groups where they're kind of like, oh, don't worry about it. If you sit for half an hour a day, that's all you need. And that's good and wonderful. And, and, and that's true. I mean, that's great. But I'm also, I like a little bit of a push. I, I appreciate being in a group that's a little bit of challenging one another and like, no, let's like do prostrations for three miles and let's do accumulate a, a whole bunch of mantras together. Um, and so it has that spirit, which I really enjoy that, that we're challenging each other. And so there's a little bit of like almost a sportsmanship quality that it's not just, um, it's everyone's taking it really seriously and pushing themselves to some degree. Well, that's a very 
I suppose that's a little bit of Western attitude brought into the Tibetan scene. They don't have a competition sort of, it's not exactly competition, but they don't have that sportsman-like quality in Tibetan uh, practice very much. So uh, that's interesting that you point that out as a benefit. That's great. Yeah. Well, I mean, you look at the lives of Milarepa and these other great masters, they certainly approached the path like that, like they were challenging themselves and being challenged. You know, if you look at Marpa with Milarepa, he pushed him to his breaking point to get that negative karma off his back. Um, and then you see the kind of results that can come from that. And I think that coming from the Kagyu lineage, you know, that that's some of the flavor. It's like we've got to get calluses on our butt as uh, Milarepa did. Beautiful. That's beautiful. Wow, this has been great. Thank you so much. I feel like, uh, although I know you, I feel I know you well, I get to know you a little better. That's very nice. Thank you. Yeah. You Is there anything you want to leave our listeners with uh, before we sign off today? No, just I'm really grateful for this path. It's an amazing thing that it still exists. And, you know, and, it, and it's really holding on by a thread in some ways you know the modern world is a kind of a beast and i think that it, as if the west if we don't find ways to really personalize this path and make it our own it won't survive mm-hmm. um so i really see that as joe this is what you've done is you've you've done done it without without getting rid of one of my llamas said this you know you can change the branches, but you can't change the roots. Mm-hmm. And that that's what I, this group changes some of the branches, but the roots are all there. The, the, the important elements of Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism, like Nundro and all of that are still there, but we're able to um, essentialize it and modernize it to a degree so that it, it works for us. I think mm-hmm. that's really special. Cool. Wonderful. Well, hey, thanks so much for being here today. And thanks for co-hosting this uh, this podcast. And to all of you listening, we will continue to put these out from time to time. And I hope that they're beneficial to you. Yeah, likewise. Thank you. Bye-bye.